So we're going to move back into uh, a few more of the biodiversity talks now. This whole session is going to be about the different types of marine fauna in the Kimberley and the research projects there. And we're to kick us off, we have the um, turtle team led by Scott Whiting, and he can introduce the rest of his crew. will be talking about that project. Thank you very much. Uh, this will be another tag team uh, effort. Uh, we've got Tony Tucker and Oliver Berry, and um, we'll have. Uh, some of the other guys I'll introduce in a minute of the team. But firstly, I'd like to just um, recognise the Indigenous partners that we, that we work with. Um, we had 11 groups in all, and we were one of the, um, I guess, few groups that had the spatial scale from the NT border right through to the bottom of 80 Mile Beach. And we really engaged with all of those groups as much as we could. Uh, some were more developed than others but we, uh, we tried to ex um, extend our engagement right across the Kimberley. Uh, just the, the team that aren't here at the moment, uh, like I said, we've got Tony and, and Oliver. Uh, I'll present on Nicola Mitchell and Blair Bentley's work on the, the climate change work. Uh, Nancy Fitzsimmons isn't here, but she was involved with Oliver with the genetics, and Kelly Pendoli uh, was involved with the broad-scale aerial survey of the Kimberley that you'll hear about and Jessica Stubbs uh, was also involved as a student on the Climate Change Project. Just uh, quickly, other acknowledgements. Uh, we couldn't have done this work without the assistance of the Broome and Kununurra um, DBCA officers. They were great, had uh, lots of staff that helped us. We also had some additional funding from the Northwest Shelf uh, Flatback Turtle Conservation Program. Um, so I often get asked why turtles again. Um, a lot of people get frustrated that turtles seem to be in the, in the spotlight a lot and they get a lot of funding. Um, and I always get, well, haven't you done enough work on turtles? But you know, basically turtles are highly valued. Uh, they've got very high indigenous values for culture, food, uh, ceremony, uh, economics as well. Um, for most people, they have some sort of value. Whether you live in Sydney, Melbourne, have never seen a turtle, a sea turtle will have some sort of value for you. And you know, that actually extends uh, right through to the local scale of people living on the ground. They are threatened, so that there is a legislative responsibility to look after turtles, both at the state and Commonwealth level and at the international level with binding agreements. So for all of those things, give them some sort of political value that at the time when uh, uh, you know, things are threatened, um, it is important that politicians will come in and back uh, work as well. Uh, and they become a priority for management these management um, priorities turn out to be uh, flagships then for a lot of different groups. You'll see WWF, you'll see Nature Conservancy. A lot of groups will have um, turtles as flagships because they link up different marine habitats. They spatially link different uh, locations, um, feeding and nesting grounds in different areas. And they have common global issues, um, pollution, bycatch, coastal development all affect turtles, but turtles are brought in as a flagship sometimes to, to make these a, a, a profile. So just in scoping the project, really the, one of the most important things was to make sure that we had uh, the parameters needed for management. And for sea turtles, some of the basic areas of these uh, is to work on the, the nesting life stage. So turtles come back, they show fidelity to nesting beaches, uh, and so we can have places where we can count them regularly. Um, but we, the nesting phase is really the first step in any turtle management. And so we, instead of working on foraging or migration routes, we come back to the nesting stage. In also scoping the project, we needed to look at what skills we had in the Womsey partners. And so that also guided what other components we, we did. Indigenous engagement was also you know, extremely important. Um, there's a close cultural tie for turtles and indigenous groups, and coastal groups. Budget and logistics were, were also involved. So the questions we ended up coming up with, the distribution abundance, the what, where, when, a turtles nesting, genetics, how related are they, climate change, what the impacts will be, and then how can we combine traditional knowledge and Western science. So just for Indigenous engagement, this is before uh, we had a formal process through Wamsi. Um, we tried to do as many things as we could to, to get on the front foot. We had early face-to-face -face meetings to discuss the plans. Um, we went through the KLC REACT process, which was the only sort of formal process that was available to us. Um, and we also, for the non-aligned KLC uh, groups, we sort of tried to use the same principles over um, with those groups. We developed some written scopes of work uh, for several groups, because that was a way 
So each group was probably done a little bit differently, but each group followed sort of similar principles. We had multiple dedicated trips, especially to go up and, and talk about planning. And so this was not bringing all our field gear uh, ready to start work. This was, uh, I think we flew up four or five times prior to any work um, with different groups to engage. And we budgeted early. We had about a quarter of our budget uh, based on Indigenous wages, engagement, communication. So I think that was our key, um, our key benefit. And we had emphasis on training when we were in the field. And I guess if we had to come back to three things that I think we'd, we'd make sure we'd do again, make sure we had enough time for engagement. I think time is critical. You've got, you've got to have enough time to do the planning. Budget, I think any, no matter how small your research budget is, try and at least hold a little bit over, you know, whether that's for wages or engagement or, you know, for meetings. I think that's really important. And then I think communication, you just can't do enough of it. And I think for any one of those, we probably could still do more and more, um, you know, on any one of those things. So I'll now hand over to Tony. Okay. This slice of the pie is um, interesting because what we wanted to do uh, was prompted by, there are at least three important prompts that we have a lot of new marine parts. You've seen these uh, spatial extents and maps on previous talks or that have been given here, that we have lots of indigenous ranger groups. And although we've seen up to seven mentioned in the KISSP project, KISSP, turtles and KISSP, turtles are a little bit on either side of that and in the middle, some of those groups. So we added a few people who are indigenous groups that were important for the coverage of turtles. But then there's the national uh, 20, 2017 marine turtle recovery plans. So the combination of those uh, prompts means that we wanted to get both deep time perspectives but we were faced with covering a lot of space in a short amount of time. So we combined the indigenous knowledge for that deep time space and the scale was best served by doing some aerial surveys. As you can fully grasp, the Kimberley is a large place to cover. And we were trying to determine those basic questions, when, where, and how many turtles are there, we started off with another layer before this in terms of planning, which was to go back over. We went all the way back to early explorers, maritime, back to the, in the oil and gas exploration reports of the 1990s and early 2000, and then made sure those were all default places we wanted to look at. We looked at where were the gaps of knowledge and how could we cover those efficiently with a plan. Kelly uh, Pendoli has uh, some experience in doing that for 80 Mile Beach, so we drafted her in doing this plane with special camera on the bottom, and what we were looking at was connecting all of the, the beaches that we could, taking photographs along the way. It takes to do that across the Kimberley about eight days of flying. We timed that for the middle of the summer and the middle of the winter nesting seasons. And where we couldn't get it in one pass, this bottom right image shows you, it took three or four passes to get Cassini Island, for example. There's a lot of corkscrewing in a plane that was needed to get all of those images. In a nutshell, I'm gonna go right to the results. We were interested in covering the winter and summer nesting seasons, and we found that out there on the Dampier Peninsula is the shift between summer and winter nesting. In fact, the easternmost uh, summer nesting was verified by the uh, uh, Barty Jolly Rangers and the westernmost winter nesting was verified by the Nil Nil Rangers. So again, we were combining traditional knowledge with Western science. The red and yellow dots you see on the map are one slide that shows all of our data. And at that scale, you're not going to see much of it. So we've looked at it in a slightly different scale, which is across the uh, x-axis. We used a log scale, ones, tens, hundreds, and thousands, and up the y scale for the winter and summer. 
the density. We took the uh, number of tracks measured on each one. And what I want you to grasp is that on the, if I could call them the small, medium, large, and extra large ends of the scale. There's actually on beaches that have zero, there's nothing happening. But that doesn't mean that our, our surveys capture those of the six species of turtles that are there, loggerheads and leatherbacks don't nest in the Kimberley, but are known to occur there. And we know that from satellite tracking, but also from indigenous knowledge. In the one to 10 end of the scale, we have another group, the Olive Ridleys and the Hawksbills. And I'm gonna to return to those at the end of this uh, talk. What I wanna draw your attention to is the extra large category, those that are in the upper right category and you can see there's only one for the winter Cape Domet and two for the summer the Lassipedes and 80 mile. So Cape Domet is a winter um, high density flatback rookery. For the summer the Lassipedes is a green turtle rookery and 80 mile beach is a summer high density flatback rookery. So we're left with three priority, maybe not priority, high density beaches and a load of other beaches that we might be able to get to or might not be able to get to. So looking at those three, we're, uh, those are going to be outstanding, but we want to look at the others, not from just the regional scale, that was the, the, the enormity of the, the scale we were covering, but breaking that up into traditional land, saltwater country and trying to, to tailor our information to local management levels. Thank you to Graham for this slide, which is, uh, it summarizes and takes the low and medium and high out, sorry, it, this is going to be only the high and, and extra large rookeries, and it breaks it up into different uh, saltwater countries so that you can see our um, information comes out differently. You've seen one word cloud before and I'm gonna subject it to you. This is again another, all of our data in one slide sort of approach. Summer is on the left and winter is on the right. And I, the, the management message should be that we have different places to focus on depending upon the season. And on the summer, the left-hand side of the slide, which is the green turtle and summer flatback rookeries, we don't have many other rookeries to look at, but if we look at the winter, the right side of the slide, there's East Cape Dominant, which we identify, but there are many, many other rookeries to be concerned about. And so if we were looking at putting um, a, a grasp of what is the, there, there are many rookeries and lots of nesting spread all the way across the Kimberley, means that's of concern. We tried to also take the 11 groups and consider our focus was going to be on nesting beaches, but we were aware that there are other uh, in-water opportunities that have been discussed lately. Um, the primary rookery, which is the second column there, the Cape Domet, Lassipedes, and 80 Miles actually have some data, monitoring data for Cape Domet and 80 Mile Beach is from 2006 to present, but the Lassipedes hasn't had any uh, detailed surveys for quite a few years. The third column, the nesting is either by flatback green or olive ridley. Primarily, most of our data were flatback or green, but olive ridleys are a really low density occurrence for uh, the Barijawi group. And the foraging, what we wanted to, to discuss was that our advice about places to go and monitoring depends on species, it depends on season, and it just depends on density as some groups might have very low density and might not be worth their time to go invest in a terrestrial survey, but they've got an abundance of turtles in the water. So we need to consider both sides of the multi-phase life history. I think what we came away from was lots of map nesting distributions and that advice is both tailored at the landscape level, but also to the local level. That information can be used for long-term monitoring, and we can use it for training the rangers. I'm going to turn it over now to Ollie. Thanks, buddy. Hi, everyone, again. Um, 
The turtles are famous for how far they can travel and uh, how long they live. But what's also remarkable, and we know this from tag returns, is that they are famous for coming back to the beach where they were born. And the question is, well, what does that mean for management? If, po if populations are disconnected, it means that you probably need to consider management of them separately or at least risk assessment separately. Now, even though turtles are iconic species, there are some parts of Australia where we know very little about levels of connectivity between nesting beaches. And what I'm going to, and, and in a case in point is the Kimberley. And what I'm going to present today in a very brief snapshot is how we view genomic tools to give us a really quick fire understanding of connectivity at, at the bigger scale. And most particularly, we're interested here in the Kimberley. I'm going to start with, with Australia's own endemic turtle, the flatback turtle. And the question we're really considering here is, how many genetic groups at the biggest scale are there in Northern Australia and focusing on the Kimberley? Um, that's roughly the distribution. And there's reason to think why there might be some population structure in flatback turtles. For one thing, and Tony, Tony touched on this, that there's some summer nesting populations. So in the Pilbara in Western Australia, um, for primarily summer nesting, and to the north is winter nesting. So there's sort of an a priori reason to think why there might be some disconnection. Of course, that could be just purely facultative um, physiology, uh, physiological responses. Nancy Fitzsimmons, one of our co-authors, has already done some genetic work on flatbacks um, and indicated that there is some grouping in, in flatback turtles in, across northern Australia. But there's some regions, in particular the Kimberley, which are poorly uh, represented in that analysis. So we sought to address this. So what, uh, um, through a combination of a lot of historical samples that have been collected by many people over a long time and a concerted effort, particularly focusing here in the Kimberley, um, we conducted some genomic analyses. Now, um, I touched on this yesterday when I spoke about genomics, but genomics is a, a quick indicator of levels of connectivity because if you've got genetic discontinuities, it's a short sign that there's a demographic disconnection between populations. So what we did, we did a kind of a clustering analysis. Gene jockeys will know what I mean when I talk about model-based clustering, but basically we're looking to find groups of turtles that naturally fall out in, in the data. We're just gonna do some clustering analysis. And I'm gonna show you what those results look like on a map. Now, when we do this clustering analysis, we, we, we do it in a series of stages. We try to force two clusters, three clusters, four clusters, et cetera, and see how the data falls out. And this is what happens if you try to force all the Northern Australian flatback turtles into two clusters, you get one or two major groups, one either side of, of Torres Strait. That's actually a biogeographic well-known boundary. If you try to force three groups, you get this really interesting result. And what's interesting for us is that there's a major division there between Pilbara, winter nesting, and Northern Australia, summer nesting. We tried to force further groups into this, and you don't get any more large-scale divisions. But there actually is a lot more to the story, but, um, which I'm not gonna talk about right now, but just the take-home message is that in, in terms of flatbacks in Northern Australia, it's three dominant genetic groups. Let's switch to the green turtles. And once again, we're asking a really similar question about how many genetic groups there are in green turtles. It's been a lot more work done in green turtles by Nancy Fitzsimmons and her students. Um, green turtles over global tropical distribution. This is representing some of the previous work um, on green turtle genetics. And there was a paradox because in Western Australia, there was one large genetic group which incorporated Ningaloo, a thousand kilometres distant from the Lacipedes on the edge of the Kimberley. And there was a paradox about that's a, that's a huge group of a massive area. And we thought, well, that was early genetic work. Is that because we just didn't have the resolving power in those early markets? So once again, we incorporated historical samples with concerted sampling. Those yellow dots represent where, where we collected samples. We're going to present the same kind of analysis. Try to do some clustering of the genetic similarity. Try to force two groups, you get that east-west of Torres Strait, that biogeographic boundary that's quite well known. You try to force more groups, you just don't get any more signal. So you just don't get any more division, unlike the flatback. So this is a slightly different story. Um, so the take-home message, I guess, is that there are two major genetic groups in, in Australia, in Northern Australia, but just like the flatbacks, there's actually a lot more to this story, which, which I'm not gonna present. And part of that additional story is we did some more focus analysis, which actually showed us that for the first time, we now can see that there is a distinction between the Ningaloo and the Kimberley. It's subtle, but it's there. That's it. For me, over to Scott. I'll try and be quick. Um, 
So this is uh, the work of Blair Bentley, PhD student, and supervised uh, primarily by Nikki Mitchell. So I'll, I'll be fairly quick. Um, so this is looking at uh, future impacts of climate change on turtles. So looking at beach variation in temperatures, the thermal thresholds of embryos, uh, the uh, turtles have temperature dependent sex determination, where at certain temperatures you'll get more females and, and at cooler temperatures you'll get more males. And then looking at the impacts of climate change on those sex ratios and on mortality. So let's go fairly quickly. I won't probably go into the, the beach temperature, but we had, uh, we used, um, uh, together with Indigenous guys, put out um, weather stations. We used uh, Australian and global climate uh, systems. We, uh, I'll, I'll go to the, I'll go to the um, results, I guess, quickly. But more or less, we can predict uh, the accuracy. We can sort of model the beach temperatures throughout the Kimberley using these techniques. And we had differences between winter and summer. Looking at the physiology of the embryos, basically we, uh, we have turtles that lay eggs. We collected those eggs. We transported those eggs with a variety of means. Put, brought them back to UWA in the incubators. They incubated. Uh, turtles were sacrificed for the good of science and uh, their, their sexes were uh, determined. And from that, uh, we had pivotal temperatures determined and um, development rates and also uh, mortality uh, thresholds as well. Um, so using a, a, a modelling approach, bringing the beach temperatures and all the physiological data, we were able to look at um, some of the future impacts of climate change. So at the current uh, scenario, uh, for green turtles, uh, they currently produce uh, mixed, oh, sorry, uh, primary um, females at the, at the last feed rookery, and any winter nesting, which they do have a winter nesting at the last feeds, would produce males. There'd be little change by 2030, but by 2070, would have more of fe uh, a feminised um, ratio of sexes. Um, we're going to flatbacks are slightly different. Um, at the moment, the Cape Dominant Rookery in the Northern Kimberley is mixed sex, is mixed sex ratios, and 80 Mile Beach in the, um, the southern part has more uh, supports more females. The interesting thing for this one is that by 20 whoop, sorry, let's go back. Um, by 2030, Cape Dominant will um, be producing mostly females, hardly any males at all, um, and by 2017, uh, 2070, it'll be nearly all females. At 80 Mile Beach, there'll be mixed sex ratios. Um, sorry, the, there'll be mixed sex ratios only if those turtles move um, slightly in their seasonality or their phenology. So moving more from summer to spring or, or autumn nesters. So it's it's quite a, a big finding that one. That some of the winter nesting populations are going to be um, producing mostly females. Oh. Not sure if we've got time for that, but I'll just I'll probably move on on to that one. So um, the other thing I just wanted to wrap up quickly was that the uh, the Wamsley projects are really built on partnerships, and I'd like to see a Wamsley model of this one through all of the twenty five projects. But uh, we've just sort of done a schematic diagram of all our partnerships, uh, right through from um, you know the the other uh, no sorry the other projects within Wamsley you know, 11 Indigenous groups, um, all of the sort of government. And so you can't probably read it on there, but it would be a quite a, an interesting network to, to map that out for all of Wamsi. Um, just a couple of big things. We had, you know, 44 meetings with Indigenous managers. We had, you know, 20 meetings with, with uh, government managers, 32 field trips in all. Um, and really the outcomes of this, uh, we had uh, nesting distribution mapped across the whole of the Kimberley. Uh, we've had got gen genetic stocks identified, pivotal temperatures determined uh, and models to predict climate change impact. We've engaged across the Kimberley and you know, the completion, I guess, of this regional scale project, which you know, is ultimately going to provide local, uh, regional, national and uh, you know, advice. So, I mean, that was, for us, it was a, a pretty big thing in the end to complete what we set out to do. Um, and I guess the, the only the, the note to leave on is I was going to have an ending slide, but really this for turtles this is not the end. Uh, I mean we should be planning 40, 50 years in advance for, for turtle monitoring and turtle conservation. You know if you looked at that uh, the 40 years across there, we've done the first little bit, the little bit in red. You know if we want to take uh, this this little hatchling, you know to this turtle here, we're looking at that sort of time scale, the cradle time scales. So that's all I'll leave on. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.